Hi again, everybody. Well, if you may have noticed when you look at my last Sigmanaz video, I had to actually put a warning on there that it's going to be a while before I'm able to finish the Samba configuration. Ran into a problem with the current release of the Sigma NAS that's being worked out, or I may back up to a previous version. Anyway, until then, I thought it'd be a good idea based on some questions that I got, how to configure Sigma NAS just for regular usage as a network attached storage device. I didn't go over that too much last time. I think I just showed how to create one share using the entire pool and showed you that I was able to access it from Windows. But other than that, I didn't go into a lot of detail. Well, in this video, I'll go into it. If you get anything out of this video that you find useful or just enjoy, again, do me a favor and please subscribe to my channel. Let's start on this. I want to show some menus first and I want to show how to set up some shares for each user. The first place you should go is to the system general. The things you want to look for, and some of them I actually set up during my last video. Make sure you have your NTP time server set. The default is what I have here, pool.ntp.org. I did reduce the time from, I think it was defaulted to 300 seconds to 240. And you got to check this little box here in order for that to enable it. Then make sure you have a host name, that's unique name on your network. I have a domain name that I purchased, pefordoers.com. So that's what I'm using. If you don't have one of those, you can put local and that's fine too. But later on when I set up the Samba, that's going to be important. So I'll talk about it more then. You also need a DNS server. I went ahead and set it to the general one. I believe that's to Google. So those are the things you would look at here. If you change anything, of course, you got to hit save. Then you want to go to advanced. And in system advanced, take a look at these. I mean, read through them. Some of them are self-explanatory. Some of them you'd probably have to do Google on to figure them out. Most of the time, you don't need to touch any of these. You could get down here and decide if you're doing a lot of troubleshooting, you don't want to log in over and over again every time you reboot it. You might want to check this box so it automatically logs in on the console to the root account, assuming you have a console on that server. Then it would make it easier for you to bounce back and forth and reboot and play around with it. But that's one thing to consider. You could also disable it if you wanted to. There's a menu there. You can actually turn that off. You would hit save to any changes you make here. But look at these little buttons along the top here. These are important, some of them. So let's go into email. If you do want to get email from the server, then you have to set up your email address. You then have to give the two. So you're given the from and the two for the email. The two will be where you want this to go to by default and either your regular email account or you could pick a Gmail or something like that. You do have to find out what the SMTP server is. Every email account out there has an SMTP server somewhere. You may be able to find that. You may not. For example, my ISP, which I use my email through, provides that and I could put that in here. It's mail dot something dot something. And then port 25 is the default for the mail services. So chances are that's what you would use. The rest of this is probably any nothing that you'd want to touch. And then down at the bottom here, you could save any changes you made. And of course, if you set up an email, you want to test it. You can click this button down here to test that you've set it up properly. Then you want to look at your email reports. Now, this is the whole reason of doing this. You want to be able to get reports sent to you by months, by weekdays, by days, hours, so forth. You just pick what you want out of here and then you pick which reports you want. There's a whole slew of them. They're all checked off the standard ones right now. And there's also one here for a custom script. If you're into writing Unix script, then you could actually write it yourself, check this box, and then you'd have to put this in here in this particular directory it has to go into on your server. Go through these menus. In order for these to take effect, it has to do a restart. So when you hit save, it'll reboot the actual server for you. So be aware of that. Swap, nothing to look at there. Cron, now, I will be using this in a later video. After I have Samba fully installed, I'm gonna want this thing to automatically back up to my other old server. And I'm gonna have to write a script myself to do that. And I'll show you that script and I'll show you what the commands are in it. And then I'll have to place it in here. And you specify when you do this, exactly when this script is supposed to be run. You can pick time of day, day of week, and several other options to it. 
These other ones, loader.conf, rc.com, syscontrol.com, syslog.com, those are advanced features of Unix. Back to general, you want to click on this password. See, right now there's two subtabs to this one. We looked at the general subtab. Look at password. The default password is Sigma NAS for a brand new install of a server. You should change that to a very strong password of your choice. That'll also be the password that becomes your root password. But be extremely careful with this. Make sure that you pick a password that you remember. You do want to look at this backup restore. This is the backup restore for your configuration. Configuration is the actual Sigma NAS configuration. And after you've made a lot of changes to this, just in case you make a mistake, or if you get a corruption, you could turn on encryption. Now that's if you were in an open network going across the internet, you'd want to encrypt it so that the, the actual file gets stored somewhere, but it's a, a sealed network. There's no external access into it. So I would turn that off. And if I say download configuration, what is it doing here? It's asking me where I want to save it. And this is on my Windows box that I'm running this from. So if I click on this and I say save as, it will actually open up where to save it. As you notice, I have a couple of them already out there in a directory that I created just for this purpose. In addition to saving it, you have the restore option as well. So you can actually restore the configuration. If you did encrypt it, you would have to decrypt it by providing a password. Now where we're going to spend a lot of time is actually creating the data sets. But before I do that, I want to show you something that's related to, you're going to spend a lot of time in that. But let me go into the settings here, the capacity alert thresholds. Once you're approaching total usage of one of your pools, it will actually start sending you alert messages. If you have email enabled, that's one of the things you will get through email. If not, when you log into this GUI, or if you look at the console, you will see these alerts pop up on you. So this is where you would change that if for some reason you felt that those were too low or maybe too high. So anyway, what I did is I have set up on this PC that I'm running this from a set of user accounts. The set of user accounts are Kirk, McCoy, Scotty, Spock, and Zulu. Anybody recognize that? My favorite TV series of all time. I created those accounts on my Windows environment here. So I'm gonna need to create those equivalent accounts on the server. Now, as you may recall, I have to go into access, users and groups, and I have to create accounts. First, I'm gonna go down to the bottom and hide all of the system users. And you see the only one I have there right now is David, myself. I'll leave that one alone. There's no reason to touch that one. That was the good default for testing it. But now I'm going to add new ones. So I'm going to do the plus. And the first one I want to do is Kirk. As I recall, his name was James T. Kirk. And I'm going to give him a password. I have to match the password that I gave it in Windows. That's important to do that. Until I get the Samba AD running, I'm going to have to match the password on two separate machines, on the server and on the PCs that I access it from. This is a standard problem with NAS devices. If No matter what NAS system you get, whether you build one with some other free version of NAS, or you go and buy one like I did originally, the Buffalo devices, you're going to have to do this type of thing in order to access, seamlessly access your shares. I'm not going to change any of this rest of this stuff, but I'm going to create a new group. Oh, I have to create the group first. So let me just leave it as guest for now, and I could change it later when I create a group. So I'll leave this one as guest, and I'll create the group next. I don't think there's anything else I have to change at this point. I can say add, and I can say apply. Now we have James T. Kirk. David is user 1000. That's the default, the way Unix does it. it starts at 1000 for your user ID and it works its way up. So 1001 is the next one I added, which is Kirk. I'm gonna create another one, create McCoy. I forget what his first name is, so I'm just gonna call him McCoy. Give him a password. Don't need to be a description, that's optional. He'll become user 1002 by default. You can override that, but I don't recommend it unless you really know what you're doing there. Set him also as guest. And I will add and I will apply changes. So now I have three users. Let me go now and do group. 
So all I have to do is click over here to groups and I can add a group. Let me hide all of the system groups like I did with the users. So I'm going to do an add a group and I'm going to call this group Trek. I can put a description. It gets a group ID too and it starts also at 1001 and the ones you created. That's really all I have to do. Now this only becomes important later when I set up permissions because you can give permissions to an individual user or to an entire group and I'll show you that when I set up the data sets. Let's add that. So now when I go back to users, I can come in here and modify Kirk, click on this little wrench here, and I can go down to his group. Right now he's set for guest, right? I can click on that and, and I want to change him to Trek. And there it is. So we're going to make him now Trek group and we're going to say apply. Now there was a clone configuration here. I could clone it to other users if I wanted to. And there I would only have to change the differences. But I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to do an apply. I'm going to change McCoy as well. Come back in here to where the groups are. I want to take off guess and then I want to turn on Trek up here. Make sure Trek is checked. Let's apply that. See what we get. Apply changes. I'm going to jump ahead here and just do the others. Okay, so they're all added now. I have this whole bunch of Treks. Kirk, McCoy, Scotty, Spock, and Sulu. So with those accounts made and the passwords now set on them, I now have to go over to Disk, ZFS, and we have to go into Data Sets. And for each one of those users, I have to create a separate data set. So to create a data set, notice there's a bunch of data sets right now. The only ones are the Z root. That was that data set that was created during the initial install on the server. When I did the share before, I did the share on the entire pool and that mounted fine. You have to have a data set to mount or something less than an entire pool and have them segregated from each other because that's really what I want here. I don't want them mixed together. There'll be separate areas on the pool that each one of these users will have. So I hit plus. It's going to pull the space from the RD pool, the 20 nearly 24 terabyte space of which only 75% is really there. I don't want to add any compression, but I have to give this a name and guess what I'm going to call these data sets. First one is Kirk so that he can load one that matches his name. That'll be his home directory that he can amount when he's logged in. Do I need to uh, check anything here? I do want to leave it restricted, which means it'll be restricted to this user, but I want to change the owner. Right now the owner is root and group wheel. So I am going to make it Kirk is who I'm going to make the owner and I'm going to make it group Trek. Now that means that any permissions that are given to the group, anybody in that group Trek will be able to do. But this is the default. So it's base owner is Kirk. The group that it, below, that it is part of is Trek. Now I can define each one, the owner, the group, and anybody else. That's the world. So that's the way it works with Unix permissions. It's three fields. So it means if I leave these check boxes for the others, then that is basically not locked at all. Anybody can get to it. So I'm going to turn those off. And again, it's three different types of permissions. Can you read the files? Can you write files? Can you execute files? Execute only applies to an executable object, which is either a program that's been compiled or a script. So I'm going to turn off the others, and then I'm going to give the group only read access. I don't want the group to write. And I'm not even going to give them execute. I'm only going to give them read access. Sometimes you may want to give others read, and then the group itself allow at least to execute. It all depends what, how, what your strategy is for creating your shares. And then I add this and then I apply the changes and now I have one that's called Kirk. It's part of pool RD pool and I'll go ahead and do a separate one for each one of these so let me just jump ahead. Oh something I forgot to show you when I created the last data set for Kirk as I'm making this new one now for McCoy. I'm trying to keep them in order. I will look at some of these other options. So Kirk is the captain. I'll give him the ability to put as much as he wants. So his data set can grow as large as what's ever available in the pool. But I'm going to restrict the others a little bit more than that. And I will set up a reservation. That is a minimum size. I have to give it K, KB, Meg, Gigabyte, etc. I'm going to give Gigabytes. I'm going to give McCoy a minimum of 20 gigabyte. It'll be there for him starting at 20 gig, but it can expand up to some number. And I'm going to make that number 100 gigabytes. I now want to do the same thing I did before, obviously, which is this one belongs to McCoy. He'll be part of group 
check. I'll set the same types of things I did before. I'll turn off the check boxes on all of the others and write and execute for the group. And it was where I remember to apply. So now we have a McCoy and a Kirk. Both of them drawing their space off of the same, it's only pool we have to draw from. I could draw from Z root, but I don't recommend that Z root. It's already got some stuff in it that was put in there by the actual FreeBSD Unix system. There is free space available, but keep in mind, it's not rated. So anything I put there is subject to loss. I will use that for transferring files between my Windows system and the Unix system. But let me skip ahead again and make the remaining ones. I'm going to do something a little bit differently for this last one. I save Spock for last. I'm going to give him a little more space. There's some special work that Captain probably wants him to do, so he might need some more disk space to do that in. So I will give him a minimum of 50 gigs and a maximum of 250. Owned by Spock and group. Rec. Missions are the same as I did before. Add apply changes. So now we have a bunch of new data sets in here. We have Kirk, McCoy, Scotty, Spock, and Zulu. So all of these are configured the same, except slightly differences in how much disk space they can have, how much they will start with, and how much they can expand to. Okay, now that the data sets are created, the next step is to actually create the shares. So I go to Services, SMB. I click on the second option here called Shares. Right now, the only share I have, well, two of them, I have one for the, for the actual root area that's 200 gig i believe that i created for the root and then i have the main pool the 24 terabyte pool and i have one for the entire pool and i assigned it the name of david so now i got to create a separate share for each of the users because i want these to be the home directories for them so if i do add let me pick one for kirk and i could say it's a kirk home directory and i got to give it a path now it's going to open up all of the available shares but in this case it's showing the parent share which is the pool itself if i click on that though guess what i have underneath it well one of them is kirk so i click on that i say okay and now i can come down and set the options that i want for the share and as i said previously i don't really like to have the recycle bin that wastes a lot of space i like to enable the zfs ACLs. that's recommended you have to click this little box by the way if you wanted to use the afp protocol that's if you want to get to it from an from an apple type system i'm not going to do that right now and I add it and then I apply changes. Now I have a new share name called Kirk. Okay, let me jump ahead. And there we go. We have all of them set up. I have Kirk's home directory, Dr. McCoy's home directory, Chief Engineer Scott. I have Science Officer Spock and I have Lieutenant Zulu. All of which I now have home directories that they should be able to mount when they log in. So the next thing I'll do is I'll log in as Spock and see if I could mount his home directory. In Windows, they call it mapping it. Okay, I have now logged in as Spock. As you can see here, Spock. And as I said, he has the same password as the one that I set into the account on the server. It has the same password. Let me see if I can map a drive. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to map one that I don't have, I'm not supposed to have access to. So I'm going to go and say map, leave it as Z, backslash, backslash, rdnet, backslash. Let me try Kirk's. Can I? Can I map Kirk? Whoa, cannot access RD net Kirk. You do not have permissions. See your administrator. It did leave it mapped, but I just can't get to it. Okay, which is what I did. I had set up the permissions that way in the server. Let Spock try to map his home directory. I'm going to call that one drive U for user. RD net Spock, enter. And boom, we're in. We've now mapped. It's drive U for us. So it shows up here. If you look at the that's it's now drive U. I have what? 250 gigabytes of available space. Actually, the server itself has allocated 50 gig right off the bat, but it doesn't show you that here. It just shows what the maximum size happens to be. We don't see that data for Kirk's. Let's test it. Now drive E has some files that I want to do. Let me go into drive E and pick video, free music. This is stuff that I downloaded from YouTube. Free, I could put it in my actual videos. I'm going to grab some of these songs. I'm going to copy it over here and boom, I've got the files. Let me try running it from one of them from over here. Works. I'm not violating any YouTube rules either because this, this one is allowed. So now I have the files here, copies of them. I didn't delete them from where they were. Let me just double check that, but I don't believe I did that. No, I didn't delete anything from where they were. 
Oh, there's seven floor tango right there. Good. And that does it. That goes to prove. I could go through each of the users if you wanted to, but I think this one says the point by just showing you one. I hope you got something out of it. Hopefully you know how to use Sigma NAS more productively. And if you did, please, once again, do me a favor, subscribe to my channel. Little head pop up here in a moment. Just click on it, follow along, and subscribe. It would really be helpful to my channel. Thanks again.